I think it's, yeah, now we're right on time and we can start. <laughs> yeah, um, this presentation will be about uh, pushing vanilla Blender to, the li to its limits with Nodes and Python and experimental projects. Um, the presentation is pretty packed, so let's, let's get right into it. Uh, first of all, you're probably thinking, okay, who is, who is this person standing here uh, right in front of me? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Vincent Dorenkamp. I'm a 17-year-old student from Germany. Uh, I've been using Blender since um, 2019 and uh, have mostly worked on asset creation and uh, nodes and Python. And um, last year's Blender conference, that was my first one, I was able to uh, meet Polygonic, and since then I've also been working on some of their projects um, during uh, my school work. So what, what will this be about? Um, when you're thinking of Blender, usually uh, you think of it as a tool, right? Blender is your production software, and you go and you have um, you, you create stuff, you create your models, uh, maybe you import some textures, and then you render stuff out eventually, maybe, uh, depending on your workflow, and in the end you have, a pr uh, you have your product. You use it as a tool. In this presentation, we're gonna turn that around. Um, in this presentation, Blender will not be a production software. We're gonna think about it as a framework for tool development. And I'm gonna share a few experimental ideas based on, uh, based on that mindset. Um, and in the end, uh, I hope that you'll think a little bit less rigid about what Blender can do, what it can't do. Uh, you'll maybe be inspired um, to build some of the stuff yourself. And um, yeah, we're just gonna go uh, through what I've been working on over the past, well, what is it now, six years. Uh, it's slight trip mem uh, down memory lane for me. Um, and we're gonna fill out this. This is uh, the workflow that I've been working on. It's the, uh, the Blender framework. And uh, we're gonna fill it out uh, based on the uh, projects. So I'm first gonna talk about the projects a bit, and then in the end, uh, we can fill out this graph. So uh, let's get directly into the first project. And um, can I take this out actually? Okay. So, um, so geometry nodes, that was uh, what the first project was uh, mostly based around of originally. Geometry nodes was originally um, solely, uh, uh, so solely revealed as a better and more customizable at alternative to modifier stacks. And over the uh, past few years, it's uh, went to way more stuff. It, we got simulation nodes, we got so much stuff. And um, my idea here was to implement already, um, already existing and use techniques in simulation optimization and game development and put them into a geometry nodes to make an easily editable uh, street um, generation with a traffic simulation. In the end, it developed over time uh, with um, everything based on a particle, sisters, uh, particle phys physics system. Uh, and like all good projects, it starts out with something horrible. Um, this, this was the first thing, and it's okay that it's horrible because it's just a proof of concept. It's just a MVP, a minimum viable product. It's supposed to give you a bare idea of, okay, what will this workflow uh, probably uh, need from me? Where would um, possible hiccups be? What, what will I encounter during this project? And for me, it's this uh, abomination. It's held together by merge, by distance, and um, remesh. I don't like it. <laughs> let's, let's go a bit further. But we can still learn from it. And um, the first part of the Blender framework on the bottom left is nodes. It's, it doesn't matter if it's geometry nodes or um, shader nodes because nodes are a useful tool. You can very, very fast iterate with them and um, it can speed up concepting by a lot. 
So, um, of course, you don't have uh, the best performance with nodes. There are uh, probably better ways to do it. For example, Python, we got, we're going to get into it a bit later. But um, if you just want to start out with a project, use nodes. So, now we're going to go into, into the first thing because, of course, the first version was, was horrible. Um, but I knew, okay, there is something to work with here. I'm going to need a better algorithm to build my streets, especially intersections and also merging lanes because at some point I want to build a highway. Um, I was inspired by cubic watermelons. They're, they're a thing from, um, I think, Japan, if I remember correctly. And what the farmers do, they just basically put the melon seedling into a box and the melon grows and grows and grows. And at some point it reaches the box, it can't grow any further. And so it uh, grows into the shape of the box. And that way they can uh, create melons in all kinds of shape, sizes and, and forms. I got this image from Wikipedia. And in this case, I combined it with uh, a binary search algorithm. And what you can see here is actually, um, if I go just one step further, the street only goes out if it can actually go there without overlapping to another street. And that way my street can grow from the inside out and in the end I have a um, very, very, very clean mesh, which uh, I don't have any kind of overlap. The uh, different vertices are very close to each other and with a slight uh, merge of distance and some more mesh filtering, I can get a fairly clean surface for my street. And uh, this is already the, the next part here of the Blender framework, which is outside resources. It makes no sense to build everything uh, from scratch all the time. Why would, why would you want to do that? It's horrible. Um, it will take up your, all of your time and in the end, uh, your solution will probably not be better than uh, what other people uh, have created over the past couple of years. Um, and we can also combine different points. And in this case, we combined um, the outside resources with the nodes. That way you can get a very, very fast uh, concepting workflow. And um, also it gives you the ability to for example, if you want to know about more about uh, a kind of uh, algorithm, for example, uh, a sorting algorithm or a triangulation algorithm, uh, you can try that, build it in nodes, and that way you can learn about it and, and try implementing it. We're, we're running through the different versions here. Um, we're now already at version three, and that's where, it's, where it gets interesting. Because at this point, I wanted to do a traffic simulation based on the intelligent driver model. Um, this is what you can see here. And specifically, it's a traffic micro simulation. Micro simulation basically refers to I'm not um, simulating something on a global scale. I'm sim simulating the individual agents, which are the cars, directly and individually. I have all of the cars there. I'm not uh, simulating how would a I don't know, um, how would a uh, traffic propagation system um, thing work here? It, it's not something with spreadsheets. I want the individual cars here because we're working in graphics. And um, I was inspired by uh, model cars originally to figure out the pathfinding of these cars. What you can see here, uh, we have this small little bit of jittering there uh, where the car turns. And uh, that's just a small um, bug that, uh, that is part of the original um, idea. Basically, I'm always rotating the car so that it's looking at the street one meter in front of it. That way it stays on its lane. And I c uh, as well, because I'm not sampling it, it's not completely stuck to the, to the lines and I can later do more complex maneuvers like changing lanes, for example, that way. And everything of this is based up uh, on the intelligent driver model uh, called IDM for short. And uh, it's this, it's a very, very big equation. You've, 
and uh, most of you have probably never seen it. Um, but it, it was the same for me. I didn't know anything about it, but luckily there's this very, very nice website over there called uh, traffic-simulation.de. Uh, it's an online implementation of this algorithm. And um, the nice thing is it actually comes with um, already realistic and figured out values for what I need to plug into this equation to get the thing. And what this equation basically does is based on um, the distance and the relative velocity of a vehicle to its predecessor, it can give me a, an, an acceleration that a driver would give me in that scenario. And I can use that and I can um, implement that into my simulation to have uh, drivers react, uh, react to different scenarios. Uh, but the problem is, um, even though I can uh, put them uh, into a node group, that's, uh, that's actually um, fairly, very nice. It was very easy. I just take it, uh, change it so it, that's in, in node form and I put it here. It still needs to know the predecessor for a vehicle in order to get the distance to it and, and everything. Uh, and the problem is when we're working in a 3D environment, we don't know what is actually the predecessor of a given vehicle. Um, so for example, for the, uh, for the lower, uh, lower left car, what is its predecessor? So is it, is it the one on the right? Is it the one on, on the top? We don't know actually. Um, and what I figured out uh, was that the um, probably easiest um, thing was to um, actually do it based on who comes first at an, at an intersection. And uh, I'm basically uh, using, this is, this is a formula that we um, probably learned in, in high school or something. Um, I'm, school system differs, of course, in every country. But I can do that for both of the cars and that way I know who comes first at the intersection and that's the car that will be in front. So in this case, we have a crash right here if, if we would um, have the cars flow at constant acceleration. And uh, in this case, because the front car is there first, we know the lower car is uh, the second one. So the predecessor to the lower car is the uh, upper car. And we get, can get the distance to its predecessor by getting the distance to the intersection. And also the uh, velocity, we can get that uh, by sampling the uh, velocity of the top car, how it would be uh, in, at that intersection. Um, I'm, assuming, uh, I'm assuming constant velocity, I'm not completely uh, always simulating uh, 10 steps of the simulation in beforehand. But um, one thing we need to do is we need to project the uh, velocity to the orientation that our lower car has in that position. Because if not, we can have two cars going um, opposite to each other. And normally what uh, they would think is they're going in the same direction. So they, uh, if the car behind says, okay, I'm um, working in, uh, I'm driving 50 kilometers per hour and I have a driver in front of me one meter and he also drives one kilometer per, uh, 50 kilometers per hour, then my gap will not change. In that case though, they are not for, they're completely forgetting about orientation and they would drive right into each other. So we need to do this uh, and the project, projecting to get the accurate velocity. And in a real, uh, real case scenario, uh, if we stop that here, what I'm really doing is I'm just taking it and I'm, for every point here, um, doing a raycast to the next point. And uh, based on that, I know uh, if on that point it would intersect with another vehicle on its path. And if that um, intersection happens, I know which one is the car in front. And uh, with that, we get this really nice weaving motion right here with the two cars going together. Okay, so at, at some points I wanted to 
uh, at some point I wanted to create drivers um, which are sitting inside the vehicle and um, controlling the steering wheel. But the problem is uh, at this time and uh, also still currently, it's being worked upon um, as far as I know, but we currently don't have any kind of system in place to uh, use animations in geometry nodes. That's a, uh, a personally for me a problem. I wanted that out of the way. So uh, what better than to start a side project for, um, for doing that myself with Python. And I didn't know anything about VS Code or, or something in that manner. Uh, so everything I did was in the Blender script editor. The workflow was horrible. Um, so what I would do is I would try out the different code lines manually in the, uh, um, in the console. And when it worked, I would copy the stuff from the console over into the script editor. Um, it was very, very in inefficient, but in the end, I got the job done. And what I found out is if I um, manually map to every single, um, to every single point uh, or every single vertex, in this case, of my model, an index, in the end, uh, I can use that as the um, position, as the X position on an image, and then I can, for every frame, I can use that as the Y position, and that way I can map the animation of, a, uh, of, ep of vertices um, in 3D space, just the location is XYZ, as RGB values in an EXR image. I'm using um, EXR specifically because EXR saves their image in uh, float values. So I have basically a, um, an infinite range where my animation could go as, um, because of that. Um, so even long distance things, you could have an animation that spans over one kilometer and it would still work because it's based upon e EXR images. Um, and what you can, because of that, you can create, for example, a uh, system for crowd simulation. Um, and you can uh, specifically set the density, how many variations you want uh, of that. And also, um, maybe for, for rendering in the end, you want to set that value to, to infinite, and uh, you want every single person in your crowd to have an individual animation. That's something you, you can do with that workflow. Uh, for example, maybe even, uh, even you have different animations for uh, each type of clothing, and then you can have uh, the same animation for shirts, for like five different shirts, and then the same animation for five different pants, and it all fits together, and you can have uh, randomly combined, uh, combined people who have uh, all their different combination of the, uh, of the clothing. In the end, uh, I'm not actually, uh, I haven't implemented the original thing into the traffic simulation, because I'm still not at the point where the graphics are so good that I can actually put that in. Um, but it was very nice uh, for learning purposes as well. And uh, that's how I could combine everything. And uh, now my workflow is complete. I have uh, outside resources, nodes and Python. In this case, I focused on nodes and Python. Um, I didn't have any kind of outside resources for, for that. Um, but I did have uh, nodes and I used Python to uh, accelerate my node workflow. And that way you can have a very, um, very nice vanilla friendly workflow because uh, Python alone, um, if you have worked with, with add-ons, it's a huge pain if you create your, uh, your project with, with some kind of add-on and you save it and uh, five years later you come back to it, but this add-on is not supported anymore and your project doesn't work. Um, by, using, by using this combination, you can get around that. Uh, for example, because uh, everything is just saved as an EXR image, in this case with, with my add-on, um, in the end, I just uh, only have 
completely uh, Blender vanilla compatible stuff. I only have nodes and an EXR image, which, uh, which the nodes sample. So because of that, even if the, uh, the add-on isn't supported anymore, you can still open up your old projects. So version four, that, uh, that was when I tried to put my Python skills to the test. I wanted to make a car interactively controllable in my uh, traffic simulation based uh, upon a PS4 gamepad. And uh, because I wanted it to be fun, I also needed custom physics. Yeah, uh, first of all, I'm gonna go over the physics and then we're gonna get to Python. So originally, I actually tried to avoid physics completely. Um, I tried to use something called the Ackerman steering model. It's basically, if you have uh, two uh, different wheels, you can draw an orthogonal uh, line um, from the wheels and where those two lines meet, that's the point that your car will rotate around. That's, um, that, from that, you can build up the curve that your car follows. The problem is those are perfect curves. You have no drift, you have, uh, you have nothing fun, no jumps. Um, and also the velocity change here on the ramp uh, is, is very, very poorly faked. I just look, okay, is the car going upwards a slope? Okay, uh, move, uh, add some velocity downwards in the opposite direction. Um, so, Okay, at, at some point I needed to go and dip my toes into physics, um, but I, I only knew um, seventh, seventh grade physics. I didn't know anything about rotation. So I thought, okay, I can probably create some kind of uh, particle physics model. That, that would probably work, right? Um, but uh, that way I don't have to do anything uh, complicated with with rigid bodies for rotations and uh, and there there's some really interesting uh, things that that happen when you spin around a rigid body and they have um, some kind of tensors going on there. Uh, still don't know understand still don't understand it. But uh, what I could do is if I have the two particles at the front and the back, I can slightly hover them up off the ground. Uh, and that way I can simulate uh, a suspension and I can do a particle a distance constraint between the two particles for the front and the back. Um, and based upon that, I have my physics system. Look at it. And the, the gravity is actually simulated this time because the, uh, because the suspension kind of um, has the normal force going in the, up, uh, going in the direction of the ground and uh, the gravity drags it down, that's why it moves forwards. Just uh, basic physics and all of the other rotation is um, completely faked. Uh, I'm just using uh, the, the vector from the front and the back and as you can see here, this is not simulated. Um, this is just always the first frame. You can see that on the, on the top uh, left there. And it's not a perfect system, of course, but uh, when your car is moving, yeah, nobody will notice it. It just hide, hide all your problems in, uh, in, in more uh, fakery on top. Yeah, uh, and now the, the fun stuff. Okay, well, now we have physics. I mean, that's, that's already fun, uh, but I want to control. I want to control, control the stuff. I want to do, do the stunts myself. Um, so I used, after long, long research, the thing everybody else was using, which was X-Input Python. It's a Python package that you can download from, um, from an online research called the Python Package Index. Python packages are something like extensions for Python. They come with pre-made scripts. Um, sometimes they have a bit more, uh, complex stuff like C code in them uh, uh, for better performance. But uh, I needed to put that into Blender because Blender doesn't come natively with gamepad support. Uh, in the end, that's what I, this is what I ended up with. And um, it's a code that 
uses um, pip, which is the Python package installer, to install all of the Python packages that I give it in a requirements underscore text file. Um, and it all uh, individually thinks, okay, which kind of things are compatible with my system, etc. And um, now we have wheels, which are a better alternative because that way you can take the Python packages and put them directly in your extension and then um, Blender loads them up automatically. But at that time I didn't know anything about them. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't use wheels. But um, it still worked. And also I uh, had filled the last connection, which is the connection between outside, uh, outside resources and Python. Um, so that way you can do a lot more complex projects that can't be done originally in, in Blender, that Blender doesn't support completely. And um, it gets very interesting once you fiddle around with, with Python packages. And it can also get uh, pretty fun. Um, so uh, I'm gonna keep version five pretty fast because it's mostly the same as version three. I took an outside resource. In this case, it was the lane change model mobile. It stands for um, minimizing overall braking decelerations induced by lane changes. And um, I took it um, and learned a bit more about it based on some online resources. There's a lecture by someone named uh, Shan Huang. I hope I didn't butcher that name, I probably did, um, on, on YouTube. And it's a, basically a full course um, of a, with, with lectures. I specifically used uh, lecture 14 on lane changes, uh, an awesome resource for, for traffic simulations. And I took the concepts of this, um, of this model and I simplified it a bit. And that's what, uh, that's what I would um, implement in the end. But I think it would, uh, it, it's still fun to show how the whole street generation process in the end would uh, works at, at the moment, at that point in time. Um, so I would have my input geometry, which is just a mesh. Um, you can really, uh, really easily see where the vertices are and where the edges are. And um, that way it, it keeps everything simple and I'm using meshes instead of curves because meshes have this uh, great thing where a vertex can have more than two edges uh, to it and that way I can create intersections. And what I do is I resample them into curves. I can still, uh, I still know where, where all the intersections are and um, then I can do the binary search algorithm, which I showed you earlier, to uh, um, grow my streets out with the mesh filtering. Now uh, all of my lanes are combined into one big mesh. Um, and now I have the street surface. I can take the outline of that and create a sidewalk. Okay, um, also let's take the street surface and extrude it a bit, give it some depth, and also uh, let's instance a few street lamps, which I very, very poorly modeled with, with CC0 textures, and um, also distribute them based on the outline. And now if I go back, you can see between these things, um, we know where the different seams are between the different lanes. And we can take those edge uh, paths, actually, and generate some street markings uh, based on those. And if we merge everything together and put the traffic simulation on top and then render everything out with uh, textures and shading, this CC0 everything, um, yeah, that's, that's how we get a combined street. So version six, that's the uh, work, in project, uh, work in progress version. That's something I uh, currently have floating around on my hard drive. Uh, it's not out yet. But uh, that was when Polygonic came on board. I uh, met them at the last uh, Blender conference and um, uh, they allowed me to uh, work, work from home. I had to learn international taxes, which was uh, very fun. But uh, in the end, I was able to, to even go to Prague and um, work on the traffic simulation there because they have an add-on called uh, traffic with a Q at the end. Um, and they wanted to do 
uh, a street generation at some point. So I, um, so I created a system. It's not, it's not fully done yet. Um, there's still uh, a lot to do. But uh, the fun part is they allowed me to actually um, take things that I would uh, create there for um, for better uh, making my system compatible with their existing version and uh, also implement that in my own system um, that was that was very nice in the end I got uh, a way better performing um, car measuring system uh, out of it I needed to know of course how uh, how big are the cars where are the different points of the axles um, and where are the wheels and everything. Uh, also, I got out a better uh, lane decal system, which you can see there. Uh, for example, the uh, tires leave behind some lighter marks, uh, which is very nice. Uh, also, as you can see here, the um, markings are a bit different and just everything gets, gets a sort of graphical upgrade, uh, which I think is quite nice. But uh, what you actually see here is my per uh, personal version. And um, I also, on my end, updated the um, models of the cars uh, with some um, CC attribution models to uh, also improve the graphics a bit. And at this point, uh, I thought, OK, uh, I, I'm going to need an, a new um, side project to, to keep me up. Um, which is this? This is, this is Rotoforge. And um, this is very, very poorly comped. By the way, it was just, just a proof of concept again. But uh, the, demo, uh, the demo you're seeing on the screen right now is um, basically an, um, a rotoscoping model. Uh, which uh, which I found online from, from Facebook. It's called uh, Segment Anything. And it's a machine learning model which I took um, and put into Blender. And that way I can refine a rough mask and create a bit mask out of it, which is basically just a black and white image that uh, the lighter a pixel is there, the more that pixel is part of the mask. So this is uh, specifically the, the model I used. I didn't use the original model by Facebook. Uh, I used an alternative um, kind of newer version of it called Segment Anything in High Quality, uh, short Segment Anything HQ. And I found it randomly on Google. Uh, it's by the um, ETH Viz Group. And uh, luckily, they have a Python package on PyPy, or the Python package index, for easy implementation, which just means for me, I can use this code again. Um, and yeah, it was uh, because I already had, had the code. It was uh, fairly simple to build up the, um, the install process. I just had to uh, switch out which mo um, which Python packages I need to download. Um, keep in mind though, originally it didn't use those text files and I had to manually put them into the code and everything. Uh, this, is all, this is all a newer version. Um, why didn't I use wheels? They were out at the time. I, I literally can't. Um, AI models are so big that we're talking about like eight gigabytes here. I can't reasonably, reasonably put that into an add-on. Uh, and as well, the, uh, the problem is because every OS or every graphics card needs a different version of the uh, PyTorch um, package, which is the um, backend for machine learning models in Python, um, I, I would have like, a, I don't know, three or three to five different Python packages uh, in the end. Um, just, and you wouldn't even use them all. Uh, that makes no sense for me. So I just opted to go ex uh, against wheels, uh, integrated wheels, and I just download everything uh, from the internet at that point. Um, also, very nice pip. Uh, like the uh, Python package installer handles everything for me uh, with the compatibility. But uh, now that I have everything in, I can do uh, all of this fun stuff like setting up the UI and getting the package um, 
and Blender to communicate because the package actually saves images uh, in, in a different format than what Blender saves it in. Um, the, the Blender uh, BPY Python wrapper is a, is a mess. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, also, at some point, I thought, okay, I want a, a over, an overlay for the mask, and it was, I, needed to, I needed to learn the GPU model as well. Um, I don't know anything about shaders. I didn't do, do any, any tinkering with, with OpenGL at the time. But, um, of course, it didn't go as, as, as fast as, uh, as just plopping down the, the code. And uh, everything started with a minimum viable product. Uh, and again, the Blender script editor, and what I would do is I'd manually type in the coordinates of the, of the um, prompt point, which is what the model uses to define, uh, to define object, and I would manually um, write in, there's, uh, that's the coordinates, um, they, those coordinates are part of my object, and then uh, I would uh, save the mask, and after, after 18 seconds, I got out my image, uh, my black and white image, and then I had to take those, put them into a separate pro uh, program and overlay them to see how accurate the mask actually is. And I'm still, sc uh, still scared that uh, the mask might actually just be one pixel off to, to some kind of site uh, because I didn't code it right. Yeah, but at some point I got images working fully. I got it um, actually working a lot faster. And what you can see right now is um, a uh, image segmentation speed run of a cat image on, of, of, I think, Pexels was it, uh, which I did. And yeah, that's it. Yeah, now we have the cat seg uh, segmented, which is very, very fast and should hopefully um, speed up the, uh, the workflow quite a bit. But uh, when, I got, when I got video working, yeah, that's uh, when when people found out about it, and um, yeah, the, the thing is, video isn't as complex as it seems because the model is so good at uh, recognizing objects. I can just take a rough boundary of the segmentation it gave me from the last frame and take that boundary and feed it for, uh, back to the model uh, for the next frame, and the model just figures out, okay, it's still meaning. Uh, it, it's probably a bit off uh, what, you're, what you're giving me, but uh, I, I think you're meaning this, um, this chamois. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure how to, how to even pronounce that animal. Um, yeah, goat. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, o officially it's a chamois. Is, is it French? Yes. Is it? Yeah. And it's a very good pronunciation. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, but uh, that way the model um, can actually follow a, a subject at um, very, very, um, yeah, just moderate speeds. Uh, if you have a person walking across the room, it can track them um, reasonably well. It, it loses sometimes a hand or something, um, but it can, it can follow them uh, fairly well. Uh, and that is what, what the what we're currently at and um, what is next? I'm, I'm not sure actually, everything is possible, I don't know. Um, but I personally have, have my projects and I'll continue to iterate upon them. Um, for example, the add-on, uh, it's called Rotoforge. Um, I recently got uh, full Linux support, uh, which was uh, a tough, tough nut to crack. Um, but also as well, I got uh, my finals coming up next year and I won't be able to, to work on it as much. That is why uh, I'll need you to, uh, to carry out that work for me. Um, and I, I really hope that I've inspired you to, to go and uh, try stuff out in Blender and just think, okay, maybe, maybe Blender can actually do that when I, uh, when I um, put enough code into it. Um, yeah, but the entry bar is, is lower than ever. You don't need to know anything about Python to get started. Um, you don't even have to know anything about nodes. I mean, I got, I got into uh, an, a completely AI in Blender 
in just five years and, and a full on traffic simulation, which is crazy to think about if I, if I look back, uh, back to it now. And um, the limit just hasn't been reached. For example, I, uh, I still haven't done a project which actually explores all three, uh, all three points at the same time with, with combinations. Um, maybe maybe that's, that's my next project, who knows? Um, yeah, but I hope that uh, you're inspired to, to go create some more. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to present here at uh, the Blender conference this year. Yeah, uh, so now we actually have um, seven minutes left um, based upon the 50 minute time frame. So if, if anybody has some questions, um, yeah, I'd be, I'd be glad to answer them. Yeah. Um, so just just to repeat the question, he asked. Uh, yeah, he he asked if I if I knew um, a tutorial uh, um, a tutorial series by Aaron Dale about um, creating a car simulation, um, a moving car controllable with a gamepad in geometry nodes. Uh, yes, I do, um, but it came out actually a bit bit later than than my thing, um, and. Uh, yeah, but I think the, the work he did is, is very nice. Yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, if, if I use uh, VS Code exclusively now, um, not, not always. Uh, I like for uh, for the very first concepts, um, I don't want to set up a whole add-on for that. Uh, so I just do the first couple of steps as scripts in the in the Blender editor still. Um, but after that, uh, I go into, into VS Code once I have a concept established. And also, I'm currently trying uh, to get the Windows subsystem for Linux working together with, with VS Code, and then I can um, try out uh, add-ons um, in uh, Linux just on, on Windows from inside of, of the thing. Uh, a huge help there actually is um, the Blender launcher. Uh, I think you ha we have the creator right here. Yeah, huge, huge shout out to him here. Um, uh, yeah, his his work is so awesome for just trying out uh, a, an add-on in different versions and then uh, even in in Linux, um, all on just one machine, which I think is is awesome. Um, so does does uh, VS Code include uh, code completion for the Blender API? Um, not natively. I'm using a um, two extensions. So the first one is the uh, um, Blender development extension um, by uh, Jacques Luc. Um, and the second one is a um, is basically a fake BPY module uh, for Python, which I can put into VS Code. And then VS Code doesn't have to know um, all of the code that's behind all of those functions, but it just needs to know, okay, this function has all of these functions in it, and that way it can auto-complete um, thing, which is um, actually, uh, I would love that in the, in the normal Blender script editor, it doesn't have that. Yeah. Sorry? 
Yes, uh, there there is a uh, a new fake BPY module um, every time Blender comes up with a new version, uh, and I think it's actually called fake BPY um, on the web. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I guess if if there aren't any more questions, oh, there are. Um, so the the question was if I have played around with ve um, growing vegetation and simulating vegetation. Well, yeah, uh, if I if I have ever um, like tried or, or have an interest in growing um, or simulating uh, vegetation growth on big landscapes. Um, yes, I, I think it's it's quite cool um, because with normal instancing you don't uh, easily um, you. you often get some kind of clipping when you have it uh, near, I don't know, a, a, a house or something or rock. Um, so maybe uh, just for that, I could uh, think about um, giving, giving that a try um, if I ever have to have the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. I think we have like one and a half minutes left. Uh, I do have um, actually a uh, suggestion up on uh, right click select uh, which I then um, want to point out if there aren't any more questions it's um, basically for the uh, image wrapper in in Python uh, in the BPY module um, and the idea is that um, we could maybe add a uh, two new functions for writing and reading images to make that a bit more accessible for new uh, new users, and also maybe extend it to work with video a lot better because currently we can only get the current video frame that's loaded into Blender if the video is also open in an editor at that same at the same time. Uh, so um, that was that was uh, yeah that may uh, give gave me some problems while I worked uh, on the. Um, on the Rotoforge add-on, yeah. Uh, but by the way, I still I still love BPY. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, it is. It's already awesome that we have the, the that the, we have access to basically every little data point that's available in Blender. The Python API is so extensive. It's awesome. So. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>